Welcome back to the Metal Exchange. We are here once again with a very special interview. This is Chris. I'm here with Justin, and we are super excited to have uh, Mr. Roland Grappo of Master Plan join us. Roland, welcome to the Metal Exchange. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> nice thanks to meet for, you here. Yeah, thanks for joining us. This is such a treat for us, and um, I had wanted to talk about this album for a while now because. It's one of my favorite albums of all time, and we both agree it's probably one of the best debut albums we've ever heard a band come out with, and and I think that's very high praise. And uh, I, I put it off so that we would have the time to actually get to talk to you because I thought that it would really be a nice companion piece to our discussion about the album. So I'll, I'll start out and say, say this, or ask this. Um, when did you decide that you wanted to do this because I'm fairly certain it started out as kind of like a side project and uh, maybe there were different musicians. There's, you know, they, there was word that like Russell Allen was going to be involved. When did you decide that you wanted to do this kind of side project and, and how did you kind of see it um, starting and evolving and who did you want to have involved and, and just kind of talk about how this, how master plan kind of came into existence. Um, as far as I 100% remember, um, I was on tour with Halloween still uh, on the Dark Ride tour, and I started songwriting, and uh, I, I'm not remembering if, it's, if it was meant to be for solo project or maybe for Halloween some parts, but Uli came to my, because we had a lot of, lot of time on tour, uh, like backstage or, you know, some, somehow, and I had a little setup with my guitar, my, my computer at that time. And I played him some ideas, and then he liked it so much. And he also had many, many songs left from the Halloween uh, Dark Ride session, or parts, not full songs, but parts. And then uh, he asked me, why well, you want to do another solo album? Maybe let's make something together and take in our ideas together and make something different than my former, I would call it neoclassical solo albums. So like more like uh, Uli and me together something. And we both were big fans of uh, Russell Allen already, and uh, I think this is how it came on the on the tour, a little bit of brainstorming, and naive as we were, we talked about this idea also to the other guys in the band, and uh, maybe that wasn't a good idea. So <laughs> anyway, the, after that, we 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 said, yeah, let's do a solo album together. So that's that was the plan, and then everything changed when we were you know, some months later out of the band. And after, you know, on the heels of your two solo albums, uh, The Four Seasons of Life and Kaleidoscope, did you purposely write these songs in a different style or was that just kind of your inspiration at the time? I think this uh, recording was a dark ride. And, and uh, you know, when we did this with Roy Z, something changed in, in myself. You know, I said, I'm, I'm done with this neoclassical stuff. Um, one reason was there was a band meeting that the band members said they don't like my playing, they don't like my neoclassical style in Halloween, and they even didn't like my Stratocaster sound. So that's mm. why I changed to Les Paul and Gibson Beck, because uh, Wykey was an old fan of um, Rampage, and at that time I was playing Autostrat, but with a humbucker like, like Eddie Van Halen did. and. Uh, but mostly I played an Explorer, uh, Gibson Explorer or Ibanez Destroyer, which is kind of same. And I played more melodic, more like um, my main influence and at that time was Uli John Ross and uh, Michael Schenker. And uh, yeah, he liked it so much. And then he said, why you play always like that? And, uh, you know, and, and then this whole Dark Ride session, something I liked a lot on it, this new how you say, evolving or, or, or getting this new sound, the, the heavier sound, which I really learned from Roy because I was a really old classic Marshall guy and uh, I didn't right. know how to get this modern sound. So he said we needed this rectifier, we needed this down tune, we needed this and that, and something changed. I, I really liked it so much that I started even songwriting in, um, already in this kind of yeah. style. So yeah, I think was... the one of the first songs, I think the first song I wrote was bleeding eyes, mm. the, the really heavy one, you know. Yeah, and 
it, it has that dark ride feel, which obviously sounds yeah. very different than better than raw. And even time of the oath, as you go backwards, yeah. you can see the evolution towards that heavier sound around 2001. Yeah. And obviously this came out two years after that. And, uh, Basically, we used also my, my guitars in, that, in the studio. So it's my um, kind of Les Paul with this very heavy strings on. Uh, I, I never liked uh, seven strings, so I used a different trick to make it heavy. Right. So um, I still have it. And uh, so we used it on the whole Dark Ride session on every song, this guitar, even uh, if Andy played some parts or Wiki played some parts, but we used this guitar. And uh, for solo parts, I used the Flying V and uh, some Strat parts, of course. But basically, I liked it so much, this kind of idea. And the rectifier, which we rented uh, for this session, I just kept it. And um, Halloween had to pay a lot of money to this rental place. But I thought, yeah, why not? Halloween should keep it, you know? I was part right. of Halloween. But, but then I was two, two years later out. Uh, so I have still the amp and the, the same guitars, the same feeling. I like this kind of style, which is uh, not on every song, but you know, but I like the Les Paul for rhythm parts and uh, and uh, still like for solo parts, uh, Fender guitar. And it depends on what kind of song we we do, you know. But that's how how it came. And uh, then of course, when Uli's part came into the songwriting process, we worked very close, very intense. And uh, it was so much fun in the beginning. And then, uh, yeah, we, we did everything like the same concept, like Dark Ride, but which more more power metal songs and some bluesy stuff and this and that. Everything melted, you know. And so as, so as this, oh, go ahead, oh, I was going to just ask, um, was anybody else involved in the songwriting process or was it just you and Uli? Mm, all the songs were written by Uli and me. Um, wait a second, maybe because Uli, Uli had one song already, uh, the ballad, Into the Light, Step Into the Light. Uh, I think some friends helped him uh, already on the demos. So um, I, I have to lie now if I say he wrote the main idea, you know. I think, uh, um, what's the name, uh, singer, the German guy. Ah, he will kill me. Rainer? <laughs> No, Basse, Basse. Oh, Hennen, uh, Hennen, Basse. Hennen. Hennen Basse. Yeah, I know his nickname only. <laughs> Henning, <laughs> Henning Basse. He, he was a big friend of Uli at that time, and he helped him uh, making this idea. So he sang, he was singing on the on the pre-production, and we played it, he played it then to, in the dark right already, to, to the Halloween guys, and uh, we recorded that song, but we never finished it, with, uh, so Andy, Andy Darius was never singing this version. Mm. And so we felt we felt both. Why is such a good song wasted? You know. So we keep it then for us. So there was the first song he had, and I had bleeding eyes. And then we had many ideas uh, from Uli, which we never finished. Uh, part was Soulburn, which was also meant to be for Halloween. So, but on the end, we wrote everything new in very quick in August, September, right after our departing. How you call it? <laughs> And uh, yeah, so many songs were so like very on the end. I think I wrote Heroes because I wanted to have something which is really this typical kind of Halloween elements. Um, I, um, I had already the talking with uh, Mikey Kiske if you want, would like to sing in Master Plan, but he refused. He said it's not his style, he doesn't want metal at that time. But he, he could sing one part or one song. And then I wrote this melody for him, Heroes. And uh, that's, that was the kind of last song I wrote. So, And uh, then we started recording, quick, quick, quick. It was so, so fast, this recording. Okay. On the arrangement parts, I have to say, one big influence was, again, Roy Z. He helped us. Uh, I was uh, flying to, to where he lives, outside of Los Angeles. I forgot the part. <laughs> and uh, I stayed, uh, I don't know, five days or one week. And he listened to all my ideas I had. And uh, and then he said, yeah, do this shorter or do this or try this or you know, this kind of thing. And I always liked it uh, when you get stuck in this kind of process and computer and listening the whole day the same song. 
and he just came in fresh ears. Hey, this is cool. Let's do this. That that helped me so much, you know. I mean, that's and, the sign uh, of a good producer, right? To be able to put everything together when the ideas yeah, are there, and yeah. then just to put it all together. This is this is kind of a Rick Rubin thing, you know. He's not really with you, but he comes and says, "This is cool. This is not." Right. <laughs> you know, and you pay him a lot of money. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but. But uh, Roy was more like a friendship kind of uh, thing, you know. I paid him some some part for staying with him and, and paid for the food and all this really like nice uh, thing. And uh, and then he he made me also uh, one song writing. He said he, at that time I think uh, the band Stained was really big in in America, and there was a nice ballad. I, I don't remember the name. And he said, listen to this song. Just make something like this. And this song was not going on the on the first album but it was written and uh we used it on the mk2 album mm. uh, as a bonus track uh with uh yeah the other thing <laughs> my brain is <laughs> let me ask let me ask you this question um, oh yeah mike DeMeo. he's from Ar- mike he's, he's from where i am in new york he's uh he's a new york yeah, guy, like yeah, myself yeah. um yeah. how did how did you get um Obviously, the two names we haven't talked about, uh, Johnny Werman and obviously um, Jorn Land, how did they get involved with the project? Because obviously um, they were yeah. on the recordings as well. Yeah, let's start from the beginning. So Uli and I had the starting point and then we thought about Russell Allen because we, we were listening on tour a lot to Symphony X or some other stuff. And we always thought, well, this singer is cool. And then on the end of the tour, we find also some... Some guy gave us a CD on the tour bus, like a, like a promo version of uh, Ark. Mm. And then we heard the first time Jorn. So Jorn came really late to our our picture. Like, you know, I, we just heard about him two, three months before. So Russell, I said, okay, Russell, our situation changed. Uh, we have, uh, this, you know, not in Halloween anymore. We need to start. That was my, my, my idea, to start a real group, not just a project. I said to Uli, we should have a real group and not just make a project with a guest singer and this kind of stuff. That's my, 20 years ago, I mean, that's how I thought it should be, you know, a real band. But I didn't want that he's leaving uh, Symphony X or something, but, you know, like illusion, create something. But he said he can't spend uh, so much time with us. Uh, he would sing the album, but... Touring is not possible, and this and that. And I said, oh, this is compromise from the beginning. And one thing I didn't mention, we even worked in, in, in Roy's, Roy's place. Uh, he came there for one or two days, flying from New York, and uh, we worked on the pre-production already. So I have many, many vocal ideas with him as well, which wow. uh, were later a bit different, but really interesting stuff. So I, I still have it here in my computer. And, uh, yeah, so it was was amazing. He was just singing uh, to my old mini disc, and here's his old microphone. Oh, that's He was great. just singing like that, this 20, 25 years old microphone, uh, Sony. And uh, it sounded amazing, you know. It's like the big compression was from this mini disc, and uh, we could use it already. And uh, anyway, so he said, no, I can't be 100% for the band working and something. Then I said to Uli, okay, let's make some clever move and maybe to get another ex-Halloween member. That was the idea with Mikey Kiske. So this idea was uh, very, very quick destroyed because I just asked him, we were both in Hamburg. I I said to Michael here, what what do you think? And after some days he said, no, he's not doing it. And uh, he just, uh, I told you already, he would like to be guest singer for one song. And I said, okay, maybe maybe it's good for the beginning. Even I didn't like 100% the idea to have guest singers, you know. Then I said to Oli, what about this great guy we heard on the tour, this Jorn Lande? So to get in contact with Jorn was, was uh, I think it took three months. <laughs> there was uh, no, no possible, there was no email around about him. There was no Facebook or something. There was no direct contact. So the only idea... I, I know somebody worked with him, was in, in France, uh, Frederic, uh, uh, French promoter, not promoter, he had a record label. Ah, oh, he will kill me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, uh, I'm not in contact with so much with him anymore since uh, 10, 15 years, but he was the only guy who had an email address from his wife 
from Jorn's wife. So I wrote to, uh, oh, at that time was a girlfriend. So Christine, uh, Christine, he always said, uh, I wrote her or called her. Maybe it was a, it was a phone number, maybe. So I called her to, to get in contact with him. And she said, yeah, he will call you back. And that's how it's happening. And uh, we recorded already everything. So all the rhythm guitars, um, bass, and the drums were finished and the, and the keyboards. Um, between at the recording, we had uh, two days also this um, keyboard player from Children of the Bottom. Yeah. And uh, he helped me um, playing on three songs. And he gave me the inspiration for Kind Hearted Light, this mm. keyboard intro. I said, can you, can you write, some, um, give me some idea? We were already on the way to the airport to bring him back. Has, you have something like Stradivarius? Like this, something like that. And he played this. I recorded it. I drove him to the airport and I wrote the song. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. It, it's funny how the, the ideas, did it. Did it. how the ideas come yeah. together because that song in particular has that Stradivarius feel, which a lot of the Children of Bodom yeah. stuff has that feel to it. The vocals yeah. are different, but the yeah. keyboards, it, it's very similar. So I, I had a feeling that that was an inspiration from him just because you can kind of get yeah. that sound. Yeah. So this was uh, the only part he played and then the rest you know, but the same why we not continue uh, working with, was the same. He he said no. Children of the Bottom is my main band, and I said ah, okay. So. Good. Most of the keyboards were done by Uli and me programmed, and he played three songs like this one and um, the blues ballad. We have the last song on the album. Sorry about those names. I'm really bad. <laughs> you know? Oh, that's okay. Listen, and. Uh, that's, so everything was recorded already, except solo guitars and the vocals. So we invited uh, Jorn, I think it was uh, very short before Christmas already. And uh, he came to Hamburg, we invited him, we paid the flight, and I said, do you have one day listening to our, you can send it to me. I said, no, please come here, we want to meet you, we want to know how he is, you know. And uh, he came. I picked him up from the airport. We went to my home studio in, in Hamburg, and uh, Andy Sneep was still there. So we, we recorded still some rhythm guitars or something. So Andy Sneep, Uli Kirsch, and me, and uh, Johan, four guys in this little room. And uh, so he listened to it, and he said, yeah, I like this stuff. It's really cool. It's really nice, you know. And uh, then uh, we played him also the bonus tracks, which we decided, Uli and me, these are the bonus tracks. We said, yeah, but this is the main song, right? The other, the heavy metal parts, like uh, like Kind Heart of Light or uh, Spirit Never Dies, the fast stuff. He said, these are the bonus tracks. And I said, ah. what? No. <laughs> and so that was our first fight. <laughs> <laughs> we started I, fighting already. He likes a lot of that bluesy material, which I mean is is there, but yeah. you see it a lot in the bonus tracks. So I'm I'm not surprised. It's yeah. got a bit of a different feel. So when you when you when you hear the bonus tracks, we have also we have two in Japan and one, you know, bluesy stuff or whatever mid tempo numbers. I like right, the right. songs, but one or two are even from from I wrote them, but or some of them I wrote and only. But I said, no, this is not what the fans, our fans, would have, you know. But he didn't didn't agree at that time. And I was uh, being the first time in my life a band leader. I said, if you don't like it like that, then you should go home. <laughs> he said, no, 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 it's, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> it, so it worked out well. And Oli was like... <laughs> and Oli was like... <laughs> <laughs> it, it worked out well because it just it's it's songs like kind hearted light and spirit never die they they have a very different yeah. sound than you know some of I, 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 I the kid rocks on it's a, it's a different song like it just it just you know it's they, they wouldn't necessarily yeah. flow into each other on an album yeah that's what i mean that's how i saw the picture you know i don't mind to go left and right uh, quite far but I thought this is not stronger than any other songs we were choosing already, you know, or choose, have chosen. Uh, my English, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the, the discussion was done, and then he agreed, okay, let's do it. Guys, I really like the material. He saw, like he always says, a lot of potential. Then uh, vocal melodies, I would say 70%, 75 was already there as a picture for him. But he had, of course, great ideas, and especially some parts he made much better. And uh, 
like uh, enlighten me was definitely lift how he made mm. it you know and um um how we made it i think he came he came back with the lyrics so months later and uh then he recorded in my studio and we did everything i don't know if it was one week or something or less and he was amazing he, he just came delivered boing he was smoking cigarettes at the time he smoked still some other fun stuff <laughs> <laughs> and i thought how can be how can be a singer smoking so much and being so good in in, in a studio you know i mean some some stuff is one take that's wow. amazing. Uh, we played in the ballad into the light can you sing this long note you know this to the light. no he can't do it he made it he made it like this oh. <laughs> you know it's... everything was perfect oh what i forgot what i forgot the first time when we met in, in my studio the same situation like Janne Wehrmann uh, before i said and in one hour or one and a half i have to drive you to the airport do are you able to make some bonus track already singing and say yeah what kind of yeah this uh, led zeppelin song this record label asked me um and i said yeah but we don't have the lyric if uh, vocals done so far yeah I, i can try and he made it just in 30 minutes <laughs> <laughs> i ha- that is one of the hey, black mama, dog- <laughs> it's one of my black favorite dog. covers of all time so to hear that it just kind of came together is yeah. amazing to me I, i i think it's it sounds so it keeps the original obviously uh, you know it sounds just like black dog but yeah. it's it's just a pristine cover i love that song we 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 made the trick uh, we didn't want to have this um uh click track or something so we we use the original recording where mm-hmm. john bonham of course has ups and downs with the tempo and only tried to keep the time the same way as, as a template so we used the template like uh exactly what John Bonham made uh, and his neep did it i didn't even know how how he made it but then we had the click track of this tempo what he has so he mm-hmm. played it fully and then uh at that time i, I i'm i'm honest now we didn't even had a real keyboard player and no bass player so we had a bass player he played three songs and Andy Sneep said this guy is horrible man <laughs> and i said yeah but why are you not playing bass i said i'm a guitar player i'm i'm, I'm never <laughs> played bass you know what the fuck? Oh, don't say this uh, what? <laughs> just try and i said okay i have a good bass you know i had a bass for so- songwriting of course sure. and uh, i i can i put some new strings on i connected it and then we searched like um, 30 minutes for the right plectrum you know and i used something which is, uh, gibson black one very old classic very very thin And the trick is I can play hard without bending too much this this the tuning but it also adds something on the tone which I really love and I I, I just found out because every bass player plays heavy plectrum you know on all fingers yeah. and I love the sound and then we 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 started I think we started with a Led Zeppelin song yeah so I played the rhythm guitars and the bass together so wow the whole album I played bass <laughs> to be honest so I'm outing myself huh. and uh that's how it came so the, the the first meeting was yawn and then months later he delivered and we felt we felt already without vocals this album is really special yeah the song yeah, so the I song talk, writing I talk was, too much right no no it's it's great <laughs> the songwriting here is i think what sets it apart obviously the the play you know the musicianship is top notch but the songwriting here is what i think kind of sets it apart from many other albums that were coming out at this time had you been signed to afm records before the demos or was it or did you just give them the finished product before it came out in 2003 no um we we just started with a idea i said to Uli, um if we if we now searching for a record deal without any product i mean in let's say august when we were fired from halloween i said how we should continue i said i still have some money you know in my account and i can can produce it somehow because i contacted already andy sneed i met him on 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 tour in, in england uh by coincidence i was listening to some recordings which i really liked and i said who's the producer you know and then i think the band from england called uh kill to this and i really liked the production i said man this is so this is exactly what i wanted like 
the next level of dark ride, you know? Yes, yes. This really modern guitar sound. And I said, okay, who did this? And then I was a bit searching internet, whatever, who he is, and uh, I tried, I didn't have contact, but then uh, we played with Halloween in England on the festival, I don't remember, but Creator was also playing there. So Creator was produced already, or the, the album at that time was Andy Sneap. Mm -hmm. So he came to the show and he talked to Mille, Mille is the name, right? Yes, yes. The, the main guy. Yeah. And uh, I talked to him. So, are you Andy Sneap? Yeah. The first thing I asked, are you cheap? <laughs> 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 I thought it's cool because Sneap, cheap, you know. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. how I, was, I, have a, I, have a stupid, I have a stupid humor, you know. <laughs> and he, he, he liked it so much. He said, Grappa, you're such an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> So that's how we, we changed the contact. And then I, uh, when I was home, I called him and we talk, talked about the production. And to be honest, he was uh, not really a big fan of this um, power metal. So And, he, and he's uh, more like this trash. And, and mm -hmm. uh, now the classic stuff he's doing, Priest and Accept. And so I'm a big fan of his productions now. You know, and uh, it was funny. But that's how we met. So... In England, and uh, one or six weeks later, he came to my studio. I said, "Can you come here and work in my studio?" Because I had all the equipment. I have I had really tons of professional stuff, uh, but I didn't know how to use it. <laughs> that was the key. I wanted it. I wanted to to play guitar at home, and to have a great guitar sound, like a real room, a real crank Marshall or whatever, and good compressor, good. Everything. I have old Neve stuff. I still have it, some of the stuff. Massenburg EQ. And I paid a lot of money at that time. But I had it at that time, you know, for my solo album. And uh, he said he saw my gear and I said, yeah, fuck. No, sorry, again. This is great <laughs> stuff. I, no problem. <laughs> yeah, he said fun, not not what you expect. <laughs> his his <laughs> albums, you know, the work that he does. I mean, he works with a lot of bands where the guitar is like the driving sound behind a lot yeah. of that albums. I don't have to tell you with Creator, obviously it's that wall, that guitar sound that really drives the band. And it's the same thing yeah. with the Judas Priest stuff. Obviously you have Halford's vocals over the top, but it's the guitar sound that drives that that product. Yeah, that's, that's um, I think it's a part of, of, of the key. I mean, it's, it's, it's a taste. Some people might say it's, it's our first album is not the key or the sound is too, the worst compliment, not compliment or Somebody said it sounds too digital. <laughs> I said, "What is digital?" <laughs> anyway, uh, oh, but wait, it's, some, somebody's it's something... always going to complain, you know. So, somebody. I think somebody going... always, always jealous. Yes, it, it came from the old Halloween camp. This statement, by the way, <laughs> and um, I was really proud about the sound, but um, as you know, uh, Andy didn't mix it, so there was a kind of part we didn't know what we wanted. 100%. We, I was really happy with the recordings. My guitar sound sounded exactly like in the mix already. There was not much done at the mixing or mastering. I can play you the stuff without mix master and it sounded bomb, you know. So mm -hmm. that's Andy Sneap. He, he was so accurate uh, recording me in a way, pushing me again, again, again. And also he has some editing tricks, of course. And uh, he's not using this so much anymore. But at that time, he was really spending a lot of time to find the best parts. And yeah, and in this world, there's so many copyings nowadays. You know, you don't need to play the whole song live anymore. This part, as you can imagine. So he, what you hear on this album is the best of my my playing at that time, for sure. You know, and the solo parts uh, later, he said, you can record it alone. You know how to do it. I saw many things. So most of the solo parts, I think, uh, are recorded alone. Mm. And the overdub, the mel melodies or some some noises or something. So, And uh, that's how the first album came out. So, And uh, everything I produced from the, how do you say, from the money. Everything I paid, I paid the musicians. I paid uh, Andy Sneap a lot because there was a lot of time hanging there. Uh, I tried mixing with Andy in England. I went there. Then um, Uli was not happy. I was not. I was very insecure. I didn't know. I didn't want it 
my main band member uh, unhappy. So I think that's that's many drummers. They want something which is not existing. They want the perfect drum sound, you know. <laughs> anyway, so I was a. Uh, in a terrible moment to say to Andy, sorry, we, we, we need to mix somewhere else, you know, to a guy you work like two, three months together. Right, right. And he spent so much power and effort inside, you know, and I felt so ashamed about it. And uh, But at that time, he was not this mega guru. He was not that, that famous, you know. Right, right. And uh, that's why we went uh, home and with this uh, recorded stuff, then I started searching for record label. Gotcha. So and I then, send it to Nuclear Blast, like 10, 10 labels, I, I, I sent this stuff. And the only really good offer or fair offer was from AFM. Even there was uh, one label, very famous, they said, oh, this sounds too progressive. And uh, Nuclear Blast. <laughs> 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 then, Listen, they AFM picked up on a gem because when it got released, you got rave reviews and and i and i don't just say yeah. that as a fan but i think that this is widely regarded as just a gem of an album did you know at that time that you were going to make a second album you know uh, and that it was going to become a permanent thing or was that something that kind of just evolved after touring or yeah so we 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 got the after 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 we got the record deal and the mixing um finally we got the the lineup. So we right. searched for bass player and keyboard player, and we had Axel Mackenrod and Janis Eckert, and we put the pictures together for the album. And uh, of course, nobody knew, knew about it, but it's funny. So the lineup was fresh, so we didn't know each other there. Right. So at right. the at the at the photo shooting was still, and also the video for Enlighten Me was uh, really cheap. I I I paid for it, I guess, as well. And my um, my ex-wife her brother was doing the video so oh, it's wow. all the family kind of thing so we took all the chances to deliver something you know and uh on the end afm paid me back so i was happy about it and uh, so we knew we continue of course and make a new album but the process for the new album was totally different because we were more like a band and we had more songwriters axel uh, had to really back from my life uh written and uh, some other good stuff and mm. then Jorn had one song but Jorn was much more involved in every song as a vocalist as a, a melody writing you know well because he got and in that, I guess that, at the ground you know he got in at the yeah. point where he was able to yeah. kind of put his ideas in there at the, at the beginning yeah. stages we had still the songwriting Uli and me basically more or less like um, all the all the all the stuff which worked on the first album we tried to continue and um uh, some new elements. Um, again, I went to America to Roy Z for three days, maybe longer weekend. And uh, he said to me, why well, are you not writing one Scorpion songs? Like really, like, but more faster, more faster. Like, you know, what is the song? Black out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wrote them. This was the inspiration, this drum groove. It was the inspiration for Into the Arena. So that uh, is totally different song, but that's the inspiration when you get some guy next to you telling you, make this, this is cool. And it helps, you know. And uh, again, we worked with Andy Sneep for the recording drums and rhythm guitars and bass, but nothing else. So he's, he said, I'm too busy. He, has a, he went really big there at that time. Yeah. Uh, was never more and all these people came coming now and and uh, so he said you know you can record everything alone <laughs> yeah that's how we did it on the second and then so, uh, yeah again so you guys you guys finally came, yeah you guys finally came to the the US for Prague Power USA uh, years later had you had uh, tried to come to the US before that and it just didn't work out or or um how did that uh, come about? No, not really, not really, not really tried because first we had a tour support from AFM, the first two tours um, that was based based on Europe, I guess, and uh, then them, which was still a little bit easier in the beginning of uh, two thousand was Japan or Asia, 
now it's also difficult. Uh, but America, I thought it's it's too far away for us still, you know, because I think the sales were not that big in America. Even the first album was a pretty good. The last had thing you, I heard was twenty years ago around. Had you been had you been to yeah. the the states? Uh, we we were at the the Halloween show in New York City in nineteen ninety eight in in December. We were. 16 yeah. years old and we took the train in from long island and went to see that show had you other than that had you been to the the u.s before or was that your first time and then was the master plan show at Prague power your second time in the u.s or had no, you been there no it was halloween i was 88 already in in america oh, okay we played a long tour support um not support a festival tour with anthrax and extras mm. And I think it was, I don't don't remember how many gigs, but it was six weeks in America. Oh, and really? first, you know, remember, I just, I remember I just joined the band, learned the songs, half of them, because we played in America just one hour or 45 minutes or 50 minutes, it, because three bands, you know. Then uh, we played, and after we finished, we stayed there a couple of days for rehearsing for Japan. And Japan was headlining. Mm. So I had to learn that the really long songs like Keep of the Seven Keys and uh, the song Halloween. We played both of them. And there are some really good bootlegs now outside after such a long time. And I see myself, there are three songs in the set. I'm not jumping, I'm not moving so much. So I'm more <laughs> concentrated, you know. That's right. Because I just learned them one week before. <laughs> well, were there? there was never time. Well, I was there say, was never it, time and... Uh, Oh, go ahead. Yeah, and and uh, Wike and I, we were sitting in the hotel room uh, at the tour sometimes just to learn these parts, part by part, you know. And it took like a long time because you can't learn Keep Off the Seven Keys in one day. <laughs> There's too many parts, and, uh, and uh, you know, when you never heard them, that these songs really a lot as a fan. A fan for, for a fan, it's easier, but I was totally fresh. Right. I, I right. heard these songs and then, uh, yeah, what is this? You know, <laughs> like a crazy guy. <laughs> a lot going yeah, on. Yeah, that's how, how it came. So, yeah, there, so we played, there, we played uh, around. Were there songs that you wrote while you were in Halloween that you wanted to play with Master Plan live? Or because late, you know, before uh, Pumpkins was released, we you know we saw that you started playing Time of the Oath and I think also the Chance uh, as well. Um, did you ever have any interest in dusting off some of those songs that you wrote for Halloween with Master Plan, or did you want to try to keep those things separate for a while? No, to, to be honest, uh, the first tour we did, um, we didn't have enough material. So we were supporting Hammerfall. And I think in Japan we were ha headlining and we had just one album. So we mm. thought, what should we do? So we played a cover song from Queen. Um Played a medley of three songs, uh, one of Uli, Halloween, I think the song Departed, and The Chance, a little part, and one song of Yawn, I don't remember which one it is, was it was just a medley. So, so we tried already to get some little older elements into it, but again, uh, Yawn didn't like the idea, not mixing these kind of bands together, you know. Right. And, but... To be honest, I never miss the old songs uh, really in, in Master Plan from, from my old songs from Halloween. I, I wanted to keep it separate. And I always thought this is a different band. I, I was writing different a little bit. Um, it's, it's really funny. The situation in Halloween was always like uh, that I was kind of how you, the goalkeeper of the songwriters, you know. I was always listening what we have already. So... Darius wrote this or Kiss Kiss this, and then of course main Halloween elements came from Waiki. The faster songs or like Where the Rain Grows or this kind of part or the kitschy, for me a bit too kitschy because I'm more a heavy guy, uh, like Power or something, but beautiful songs, you know, the fans loved it. So I said, uh, we have this pictures, like I said, the picture should be like that. There should be something's missing. I felt, okay, let's make a heavy one, like Time of the O's or uh, the other one. Mr. Ego, this kind of new elements. I said, why should I write another I Want Out or some Future World when the picture is round? You know, we have enough. Later, Uli started even with great stuff, you know, like um, uh, on a Better Than Raw album, he came with amazing ideas. So and I thought, 
I was a bit out of uh, ideas at that point, but normally I always search for, for the position, how can I add something to the missing parts, you know? I always but, felt that your song, but, both you and Uli's songwriting was very underrated. I look at a song like Revelation, which was, uh, you know, a better than Raw tune yeah. that he wrote. And that, that was just, to me, yeah. that's the best song on the album, you know, in, in my opinion. And for yeah. some reason... And it's, and it's also, also, I think I don't have uh, writing credits. Uh, just one song we did, uh, the whole band together from Waiki, basic song. I, I don't remember which one. A good right, song. Right, right. But Revelation, uh, I helped Uli with the songwriting as well. I mean, this dan da 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 this is my part, you know. No, that's Push, sorry, I'm, I'm mixing it. <laughs> but Push, Push was also, some parts was mine, some some ideas came from the producer, Tommy Hansen. He helped a lot with all his songs, and he made it great. So, but Revelation is amazing. New I think that's, is kind I think of that's personally, I think that's personally my yeah. favorite Halloween album, in all honesty. I feel like the the group was just... Mm the way that you all came together with the songwriting and everything. And I know you don't want to yeah. go too, too deep in the weeds, but I mean, I, 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 that was such a great album. And the fact that we got to see you guys in New York while you were touring that album and we got to hear, you know, revelation live and got to hear, I, I'm trying to remember if you played push or not, but I know you definitely played. I can and, 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 and the chance, which is one of a I know me and Justin yeah. both love that song. Um, so getting to hear that live was, was really cool. So, um, that was we yeah, when, it, when you imagine this is the first song I wrote for the band and uh, I just tried to analyze as an outsider I was I was already two years in the band but I felt still like an outsider because the band didn't know what to expect from my song you know I just started I thought this is what I how I understand a more mm, not not so brutal song of Halloween elements you know but still a little bit catchy like final countdown or something like the lid, that's kind of stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah. Da, 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 that's that's that's. I wanted this kind of feeling, you know. But of course, I didn't reach this mega hit. But but it's something positive I wanted. And sometimes you have to analyze stuff, um, especially when you're a new guitar player in the band. And but what is really natural and and on my uh, how to call it personality or songwriting or as a guitar player is all the positive melodies. It's, it's not fake or it's, you can't create it 100 percent you know that's why many many people still are writing me also old fans or young fans from from which like my parts and halloween or solo albums they say how, how do you create these songs or how you write these melodies i said i don't know it's easy for me you know if you give me a part which is interesting enough i can sing you immediately the melody which i would play on the guitar Maybe because I'm also singing, maybe I make it more for my head instead. Many guitar players are too addicted to the scales and to the fingers, you know. But the best stuff, I'm always trying to, to get it like with the head first, you know. At least the beginning, and then sometimes I get cool stuff with the licks or some guitar stuff. And I think the best songs are always wrote uh, with drum patterns and keyboards first. When I find something like good chord progression, then I can make some interesting guitars. But I'm not the guy who writes on a guitar. That was always boring for me. I have to really kind of say that. last, I guess, right? The guitar, where you'd always, yeah. even though you're obviously known yeah. for your guitar work, it would be the last thing you'd kind of put on top of the song. That was, yeah. Came, yeah. If, 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 if you have a guitar riff first, and then it's maybe something like ACDC or something, you da 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 or something. What else should come? That's it, you know. <laughs> right, right, right. So I try to I try to find the interaction between keyboards, which is not always so loud in Halloween or Master Plan, but there's always some tension which I like, you know, because I always liked uh, these bands, 70s, 80s, 90s. I always listen to keyboard bands, uh, Toto, Purple, Uri Heap. Sticks, Journey, Foreigner had keyboards. Uh, Grand Funk, even later, my first favorite, favorite band. Um, even UFO had a lot of keyboards, you know, which made, made the interesting uh, playing of Michael Schenker, you know, more interesting. Mm -hmm. even. I, and I, that's, that's, that's what I liked. Even, even in a heavy metal band, you can have these elements to inspire you or make the song a bit more, something better, I don't know. It gives atmosphere, I think, to the song where it's not just yeah. a song, but it really adds like um, I think of a song like Soul Burn, where the keys really set that dark mood yeah. 
uh, where yeah. I don't know that you have that just with the crunch of the guitar. The keyboards really set yeah. the whole tone for a song like that. Yeah. The keyboard was the first idea, and the ding kong kong, really stupid. <laughs> but um, this beginning in intro part is, is from Uli, and uh, he, mm. he also made this guitar. Da da da, da da da. I said, wow. And then uh, we never finished this song. Uh, this was one part of for the Halloween Dark Ride session. And then we, we had not, not a good chorus, and I said, hmm. Then I searched for my. Um, I have the puzzle in my computer with parts which I never used or something. I said right. this could work. So I had the chorus. The chorus was for my, and then we put it together, and that was the chem chem chemistry, you know. Yeah. That's a uh, songwriting we did, and I think the the strongest part also from the first album, also from the second, uh, or what we learned maybe in the dark ride or something. But we said we have good songs, we have good arranged songs, but the arrangement is the key to keep the listeners more interested or surprising with our songs. So we never have this one, two, three, four parts. We sometimes second verse is half or just three parts, three, one and a half. And when you think it's coming again, it makes, uh, and you get awake somehow, you know, refreshing right. the ears. And that's, that's what we tried on every song there. And uh, don't give any time that people get bored on any part. That's, that's how we arrange these songs. And, uh, yeah, and the first thing I said to Oli, let's work as hard as, as we never did before, because that's the only chance we have. Well, you certainly that's hit a home run, and I, I guess before we let you go and we, and we talk just a little bit about the future and, and I guess what what you're working on now, do you have mm -hmm. a favorite song from this album that you uh, you say to myself, this this was the one where I really hit a home run with um, with this first Master Plan album? No, okay. I like every song. It's, it's amazing. It doesn't matter if I wrote it or if Uli wrote it or if you wrote it together. I like every song. It's such a... depends on the mood I have sometimes, you know. Uh, and I can listen to the whole album. I'm, I'm not doing it, by the way. I'm not, not the guy who's listening to your back catalog. Sure. Sometimes people sending me videos and uh, especially old Halloween bonus tracks or something. I said, oh, my God, I didn't hear this for 20 years or something. Right. That's, that's, re that's really interesting then. But I'm not like a fan listening to my own music, you know. I'm listening to totally different stuff. And that's sometimes disappointing people when they hear I'm not listening to power metal. It's, uh, you make power metal because you have it in your blood. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, I don't think... Rob Halford is listening to Judas Priest all the time. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, why it's don't you like, uh, it's, no, please it's, go ahead. It's like, I just to ex explain you uh, all these great heavy metal guys, which started in the 70s, late 70s, like Saxon or Judas Priest or whatever. Who started it? I don't know. Black Sabbath. Um, these people never listened to the same kind of music, what they created, you know. And that's why many Halloween fans or guitar player who are really influenced by Halloween want to copy this. And I said, when you copy this, you're not getting any anything new. I listen to totally different music, like total. Steve Lukasa was my, my hero as a guitar player. Michael Schenker, John Sykes, all these people did different music. They're, they're not really heavy metal. Um, I listen to proc a lot, you know, like Zaga or... or, or you know, Kansas or something like this. Not not really jazz, a little bit. I like the Spectrum album from Billy Copham, where, mm. you know, this is like something I like. But that's the edge already. And uh, and these people don't don't like that. They just like heavy metal with high screaming voices. And that's too... You can't get any further with that. If you listen to this, you should try something uh, different then. Or more extreme, more, more extreme metal or something totally different. Yeah, and and I, if you I, just I, copy the style, which was already 20 years or 30 years ago, it's boring. That's you know? part of the reason we do the podcast, because it gives us a chance to kind of go back and listen to stuff that we may not have listened to recently. I mean, yeah. this album is a little bit of an exception because I still listen to it. But there's other stuff that we've revisited that we haven't listened to in maybe 20 years. And it's interesting to see how our um, opinions change over the yeah. course of time, because I find myself listening to different things. And... Um, 
one of the reasons why this album is so colorful, it's, of course, my influences and Uli's influences. Uli, Uli is, uh, I don't know, nine nine years younger, so he has a bit different influences, you know. Mm. He was uh, more metal than I was, to be honest. He, he, he really grew up listening to Annihilator and all this stuff, which I didn't even know what it is. Right, <laughs> I know right. Jeff Waters, of course. So I checked it out. I said, man, yeah, that's, that's some of the parts Uli is using for the songwriting, this kind of really brutal guitar stuff. But uh, we both love Rainbow. We both love this kind of old stuff. So Uli had a cover band, Rainbow cover band, and uh, made even this album, Catch the Rainbow. And you see all these diff, uh, influences came also to Master Plan. And of course, then Jorn has exactly the same idols, except that he doesn't like power metal <laughs> so much. <laughs> you know. So he, he likes Deep Purple, he likes Whitesnake, he Coverdale, and, and, and mm -hmm. uh, Deep Purple. We both love John Farnham as a singer. He's my favorite singer. And uh, yeah, all these people like Little River Band where John Farnham was for a while singing. It's totally different music, but I, I loved it. You know, it's good arrangement. It's good um, harmonies, choirs. You learn from these people. And this is what you hear on the first album. L like, not obviously, but a little bit here, a little bit there. Subtle, subtly, I think you hear, you know, definitely, obviously you hear a little bit of all this very subtly on, on a lot of these tracks. Um, and yeah. like I said, but we'll, we'll let you go, but tell us what the future has in plan for both you and uh, will Master Plan be releasing any new material in the coming years or, you know, what's in store for the fans? Yeah, we, we are, pff, yeah, we're really late with our releases, but um, I started last year in August songwriting for the new album. And I had a lot of breaks because I'm uh, more or less now um, in my studio busy with uh, mixing other bands like Lords of Black or other. Mm. Now I mixed in the beginning of this year the first Chinese band. And uh, yeah, that's my main business in the moment. And uh, because of this pandemic, we didn't have many shows. We had many shows canceled. Now we played uh, beginning of September, our first show after two years. <laughs> And it was a magic, you know, it was a Manacy Festival, it was great. Mm. It was like nothing happened, you know. We rehearsed uh, every every guy at home like three, four days before the show and uh, went like this, you know. That's magic great. is there. Um, continue about songwriting. Uh, so I had a lot of break because I switched houses and um, the last three, four months I didn't work on, on the master plan. But now the studio... It looks like a mess here, but uh, it's nearly done. Um, so I will continue songwriting. And it's just one song missing, to be honest. One, uh, I, I spoke with AFM Records a um, week ago to make plans for the release. And the release date will be, it sounds very late, September next year. But we want to um, show already the first song or video in February. So Great. Oh, we'll yeah, do we'll it like, uh, like a bit. Yeah, we have, we have a different kind of, uh, not release date, what album out and this, you know, nowadays the labels has to work like one single, second single, next month, three, and then the album comes out. That's so right, that's right. So It gives me, a little, gives me a little freedom, yeah. So that's a plan, September, around September uh, next year, album. And then the surprise comes um, because we have um, 2023, January was is 20 years of release date of this album. We talked about it. Wow, that's right. So, so something special will come out. Uh, some, I don't know what they're planning, re-release or some new vinyl or something. But there's also some stuff I talked with them. I have a lot of uh, live material from this tour and oh, wow. a video um, with the original old lineup. And we were on tour with Hammerfall. And we played in, in Gothenburg, uh, 20,000 people or 25. I mean, Hammerfall fans. At that time, nobody knew us. We, we supported them and the people were like, uh, who is this? <laughs> and after that, they knew. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I have the uh, recordings, um, the live mixing I did already uh, many months ago. Over the years, I always went back to this uh, yeah, mixing process, updating fixing some parts. Um, one kick drum was uh, very bad recorded. Like always, Autumn Halloween was the same on the High Life uh -huh. video. Uh -huh. and they forgot one kick drum to mark it. <laughs> <laughs> we we anyway, won't tell anybody about that. That's the story. That. And 
Yeah, so maybe maybe there will be this bonus video coming out with a re-release of this first album. So that's a, the idea. Nice. Celebrating 20 years. Yeah. I want to I want to leave you with a a funny story. Not that funny, but interesting. Um, I remember when this album came out. I was a uh, I was a junior in college, so I would have been twenty one or maybe not even twenty one years old yet. And um, I had a friend, uh, Nops, who's a fan of the show, and he always would gravitate more towards prog metal than power metal. But he mm-hmm. loved this album, and he. Um, he listened to it again this week in, in anticipation of the episode, and he was like, "He's like, I can't believe how how much I still love this album." And and his, his favorite song, I, I don't want to misquote him, but I'm pretty sure it's "Bleeding Eyes." He loves that song so much. So yeah. uh, that yeah. just goes to show you, like, I mean, I think that this album reached not just power metal fans, but but any any sort of fans of of just really good songwriting and, and melodic hard rock and and i i think that the songwriting between you and uli married married with the vocal stylings of yorn made yeah. this really just incredible you know package all together so yeah something something also felt this is something magic um maybe maybe there was a highlight of our career because it was, it's hard to beat this album you know Mm-hmm. I know it, and I know I'm not even trying it anymore. It's like you need the same uh, people together at the same uh, at the same time at the uh, at the right time. If we if we let's say we would make another another the same same band the, another album, it won't be the same. Right because time, it's done. You know, right time, right, right place, time. right people, masterpiece. I mean, I and think that pretty had, much sums it we, up. And also, uh, you need this kind of. Um, feeling what we had at the time that we we have to survive if we don't survive with this album um we had a lot of uh, pressure bully and me and maybe that helps also sometimes you know when you when you make songwriting and uh, arranging songs and thinking how how can we reach the right people not just being creative like no, normal musicians want to be creative you know let's let's write a different kind of song you know <laughs> When you get the money, the success, and you have all the freedom, but we didn't have it at that time. So I spent my money and I got it back, and I was happy. So, but so that was the right moment. I think that's that's the album, you know. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate doing this deep dive in an album that's almost twenty years old now. I, I can't believe that it's twenty years, but we're we're, yeah. we're, we're getting closer. Um, and just again, thank you so much for your time. I'm sure a lot of people will enjoy what they just heard. Thank you very much, guys. It was a funny interview. (laughs) Thank you, Roland. You made our jobs very easy. Thank you. It was a pleasure to talk.